Hi everyone. So I'm going to speak in English because I know there are some people that don't understand Portuguese in the crowd. But so we've just seen a clip from one of my uh, pref preferred series, the Big Bang Theory, which I'm sure that most of you know about. And we've seen that Sheldon is trying to teach Penny how to behave according to what he thinks is the correct behavior. And so he's giving some reinforcements, giving some reward every time that she does something that he thinks is correct. And of course, Leonard is not so amused and is telling him that uh, you cannot teach humans like you teach lab rats. But actually, this is exactly how we learn to do new things. This is how we learn to ride a bike, to walk, or to drive a car in shifting gears. This is something that in neuroscience we call operant learning, or, yeah, okay, operant learning or reinforcement learning. And we do this by trial and error. So when we want to learn something, we try different uh, solutions or different actions for that specific task. And we err a lot, but many times we get it right. And learning means that more often we get to select that specific action that gives us some reward. And so we train, we get better, and we increase our performance. For example, let's say that you want to learn to play tennis. Everyone knows the rules of the game. So you want to serve to the opposite corner, and you want to hit the ball on the rectangle. When you start learning, what happens is that you're going to hit the ball way too hard, and the ball is going to fall way, long, way longer than it's supposed to fall. If you hit too smoothly, it's going to hit the net, and it's going to fall short. But every now and then, you hit it exactly how you're supposed to hit, and the ball falls exactly where it's supposed to fall. And learning means that your brain is going to interpret that sensation, that reward, and is going to say, OK, I'm going to have to select more times this activity that is going to send these commands to my muscles to contract and distend exactly how they are supposed to do in order for the ball to get exactly where it's supposed to be. And we do this over and over again. We practice, and we get better. We increase our performance. But all these examples are motor skills, the examples that I gave you, like walking, like riding the bike, playing tennis. What I'm here to say today is that this is not just true for motor skills. And for example, we've been doing this with brain-machine interfaces. A brain-machine interface is a system that allows us to record neural activity, to convert it in a way, transform it into an input command to a device, to an external device that can range from very simple games to much more complicated and complex systems, like a robotic arm or even a plane. And then we get to get the feedback from the behavior or the action on that external device and compare it to what was our intent. And what we hope is that if we are able to modulate our activity with time and training, we're able to get the action on the external device exactly the same or very similar to what we intended it to be in the first place. And so for the last few years on my PhD and in our lab, We've been working with brain-machine interfaces with humans using electroencephalography, and many of the crowd here is from medical school, so they've seen this for sure. And we use electroencephalographies to record the brain activity from the subject's, uh, from the subject's brain. And we use this with a system that is similar to what you see. It's a cap that has a bunch of holes, in our case, 64 holes where we put electrodes that get in contact with the scalp where we can measure the brain activity uh, and we can then transform it in a way that is a bit more, gives us a bit more information. So for example, what you see on the right are the brain waves that have been uh, found many, many years ago and we are able to first uh, uh, nominate them with the uh, Greek letters, so these beta and uh, alpha waves, for example. But we are also able to correlate specific behaviors and specific uh, actions that a person is doing, for example, sleep or drowsiness or arousal. We are able to correlate them with specific bands on this, uh, on this uh, activity, brain activity. Actually, what we're doing then with brain-machine interface is we're taking these uh, brain waves, we're uh, combining, uh, combining them in a way so that we are then able to process it and send it to a device that is then uh, expected to be controlled by the user. So just like before, now we replace that brain with a 
person's brain and a real person's brain. We bring these subjects to the lab. We set the cap. We set all the system. We have the system acquiring and processing that data in the computer. And then we send this to a very simple game, simple but engaging, because our objective here in science is to control as much as possible all the variables. And so what you see here is an example of that task that the subjects are performing and that I've been running throughout my PhD. So you see four horizontal lines, and the task is really simple. You have a cursor the, that the position is vertically changing according to the brain activity that I'm transforming. And the objective initially for the user is to be able to keep the ball or this cursor, this red cursor, within the two middle lines uh, on the screen. If he's able to do this for two seconds, he's then going to be starting a trial, which is indicated by an arrow that point is, points up or down. And with this, the objective then is very simple. He has to, if the arrow is pointing up, he has to pass the uppermost threshold. If the arrow is pointing down, he has to pass the bottom threshold. So super easy. Now, there's one more rule which is the one that links this more or less to what we saw with Sheldon and Penny, which is every time he's, doing, he's going in the correct direction, if he passes one of the thresholds, the first one, we give them a slight light, a slight flash of light. So if it's down, for example, we give a slight uh, flash of blue light. If he's able to go way further and reach the goal, we give a longer and darker flash of light. And so I'm sure you can already relate this to the chocolate that Sheldon is giving to Penny, right? So this is the reinforcement. This is the reward. And so what the user wants is to get more of this. This is a game. It gets super engaging. It really wants to perform better and better with time. So just to clarify more or less what the user sees from the user end, what, what he sees is this after uh, a few days of training. Hopefully, we can play that video. No? <laughs> OK, there we go. So what we, the user sees is this ball going up and down. And the objective then is stayed for two seconds in the middle. He has to move the ball down. So he's trying to do this. He's getting this little tap on the shoulder, let's say. OK, you're doing great. Continue selecting that activity. And eventually, he gets it. Then he goes again to the middle, he gets another trial, now he has to go up, he manages to do this. And as I said, this is midway through the training, but even though he's getting quite good at it, there is still a lot of things that he is not able to do. And so, for example, here, he's trying to go down, he almost reaches the threshold, but eventually he goes on the wrong way. And so this was an incorrect trial. And so what we set to do in our PhD, or in my PhD with our lab, was to uh, take this task and see, can subjects actually learn to control, to modulate their brain activity in the way that we want in order for them to play better at this game? And so, how did we do this? We took the subjects to the lab for two weeks. So, starting on Monday, we had five days of training, and we gave them the weekend because that's one thing that uh, uh, Penny or Leonard is right about. These are not lab rats. So we gave them the weekend. And then we brought them back on Monday, another week for five days of training. And we wanted to see, do they increase the performance? So 50% would be the chance. So if I show up, they can go up or down. So that's 50%. If they get better at, at the game, they are going to get better or higher percentage of correct trials. So this is what we saw. So from day one, they already started better than the 50%. They had a slight drop during the weekend, but they continue getting better. So they really managed to, to get good at this game, and they understand how they have to change their brain activity in order to control that game. But not only that. We also wanted to understand whether this training can be consolidated. Can I retain the things that I've learned? Think, for example, riding a bike. If I learned to ride the bike many years after, if I didn't ride it for a long time, I can go back and ride it again. So is this true also for this kind of learning? Well, what we did was we kept this, the subjects for three weeks without doing any of this uh, activity. And then we brought them back in the lab, and we asked them to do exactly the same as what they had done for this training period. And what we saw was that the... All right. So what we saw was that the performance was way better than the first day, and so there was indeed some consolidation. 
So this was really cool, because now we see that there is some parallels between the way that we are used to learn a normal skill, a normal motor skill, and what we are learning here. Not only that, but we also checked that this was indeed true by comparing this with control sessions. And in this case, when they don't have any feedback or they, do, they are not aware of how the, the brain activity is changing the position of the ball, they get chance level. So they are not able to perform as well as, uh, as when they are in control. So this is great. I mean, for right now, we understand that people are able to control, to modulate their brain waves, to play these interesting games. And so we wanted to see, can we take this a bit further? Like, OK, this is a super simple game. As I said, very constrained uh, situation. Can we take it to the field, for example? So we collaborated with a company here in Lisbon to try to control a drone. And in this case, what we did was exactly the same system, but instead of sending the signal to just a normal game, we were sending it to a drone, as well as this display where the user or the pilot was getting some feedback. So we, indeed, on the bottom left corner of the screen of the, the user, you can see the same kind of game. And, um, and on the rest of the screen, we see this is Obich, where the drone was flying above us. And uh, there was a yellow line that that was the path that the drone would have to take. And we see that the, on the bottom right, the, the co there was a conversion from up and down to left and right. Okay? So what we, we can see now is that the, the plane or the drone is indeed able to follow that line we are able to transform that up and down to left and right, or the pilot is able to do that. And uh, even though it's quite wobbly, like we, we probably wouldn't like to fly on this drone right now, I mean, at least it's a proof of concept that this can be applied to other applications and this can be widely used. And again, this was really cool to do, but we wanted to just give one more step. Like, can we then take the exact same thing but start applying it in a more or similar, uh, more real situation, let's say. So what we did was we did a collaboration with the Technical University of Munich, and this time we wanted to go closer to an actual airplane. And they have this amazing simulator of an airplane inside the room. It's like a real airplane cockpit inside the room. And we were sending the signals to the cockpit or to this uh, screen for feedback, as well as to the actuators of the, of the airplane. And so if it works here, it would work in a real airplane. This is where the pilots for Lufthansa train, for example. And so what we saw was that when the user was trying, uh, let's see if it goes, OK. So here, the, the pilot was trying to direct the plane towards a, a specific heading. It's difficult to see, but on the screen, there is a small green target. So you have to, the pilot has to rotate the plane to that heading, stay there for some time. So there's this loading bar getting full. And then once it's completely full, a new target is given. The pilot has to turn the plane to that new target, wait there until the bar is full. And this repeats over and over again. And so again, this was really cool to see. Now we don't have just a lab setting where we're doing these experiments in a very controlled way, but this is very similar to reality. So we see, okay, there is an application and there is something that we can do with these signals, okay? All right, but so, again, this is, this is awesome, but we have, as you see on the, on the image, we have a, a cap with a bunch of electrodes, cables coming out, we need the computer to process all that data. We need, uh, it's, it's, a, it's still a very controlled setting. You wouldn't be able to use it on a day-to-day -day life. So what is next? Well, right now, I'm finishing my PhD, and our idea is to move yet one step further. We want to bring this kind of technology more to a day-to-day -day setting. We want to allow you to use this kind, of, uh, this kind of technology. And so what we are developing in MindReach is a system that um, allows us to record exactly the same activity. So we have much fewer electrodes, but still we want to be able to provide the exact signal, the same strength of the signal as we saw with this very clinical and research uh, setting. 
But we want to do this also wirelessly. So we want to process all the data, and that's what our first prototype does. It processes all the data on the headset and then sends it to whatever device you want to control. So if you have a game that has been developed for the phone, you're able to control that game on the phone. So we're developing this to allow for a more democratized use of this technology, if you want. Also, we, we are targeting games as our first step, but our real objective would be to target the healthcare market or the medical market. Because I think here is where the applications really can make a difference. We can really impact people's daily lives. But so with this, I hope that you can see that we have a bright future ahead. We have a much seamless way of controlling devices if you want, that we can even bypass our motor input one day, hopefully. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of these people that have contributed. So of course, this is not just my work. This is the work of all our lab and all of these institutions, which it wouldn't be possible to reach all of these amazing results without them. And I want to thank you for paying attention. Thanks.